I grew up on a seemingly unremarkable estate in Peckham in South East London, in a space surrounded by high-rise buildings, neighbours playing familiar tunes and homely smells. I grew up hopping from concrete slab to concrete slab, playing hopscotch freely in the environment around me. To be honest, I don't think I've ever stopped playing. Being playful has helped me jump from a career in aerospace engineering, to nuclear fusion, to producing software, to face risky situations with a smile, to swim sideways just for the fun of it, and to ultimately launch Dream Networks as I dedicated my engineering career and my life to making play possible for all. Perhaps like me, when you're younger, or like 10 years old, when I was younger, the color chalk on the ground below you navigated your play. Or maybe you'd love to swing high into the sky, or perhaps you like to play hide and seek. We have such vivid memories of playing when we're younger because playing is so important to us all. Play is a child's human right, and it's fundamental to the, their development and to them thriving in life. As a play engineer, and academic, my 20-month-old son, Dylan, is a huge source of inspiration to me. Amber, when he first experienced food through play, he stared intently at the foreign object slowly approaching his mouth. It was delicious yellow potato puree packed on a green spoon. He touched it with intrigue, and before swallowing it, it swirled around his mouth. He tasted it, he played with it. Now Dylan is 20 months old, his favorite way to play is with his digger set, or as he likes to call it, digger, digger, digger. I watch as he develops his fine motor skills as he pulls the pieces apart and problem solves as he carefully bangs them back together. Dylan, like many children, is experiencing the world around him and essentially developing through play. And this innate behaviour to play does not stop when a child is 20 months old. It evolves and it transforms over time. A curb that's once a risky balancing beam can become a jumping pad for a skateboard or somewhere just to sit down with friends. And the way one child experiences play can look completely different to a child of the same age, gender and ethnicity. Yet amongst all this diversity, there's one common thread. Children intrinsically play for the joy and pleasure of it all. And the lack of this joy can have catastrophic effects on children and indeed on us as a society. For many years during the 1980s, Romanian orphanage children were robbed of their human right to play and to experience this joy. As a result, their physical abilities, their social, their language skills, their cognitive thinking skills were significantly stunted. The good news is that research later showed that when these children were cared for and given opportunities to play, they began to heal. They began to recover some of their lost cognition and speech. Now today, we're seeing firsthand the impact of COVID-19 on children's ability to play outside with others and socialize an adverse effect is still having on thousands of children's mental and physical health. A survey of over 700 parents in 2021 confirmed that a lack of access to outdoor play facilities had harmed their children's health. But it's not just COVID. In the UK, in the USA, across the world, playgrounds are closing at an alarming rate. 500 playgrounds have closed in the UK since 2014. And we know that globally, children in economically poor areas are significantly less likely to experience play and have access to play areas and to be able to thrive. We are facing a play emergency. And it's one that requires us to act. We as adults are the gatekeepers of children's life experiences and it's our responsibility to ensure this prolonged season of play deprivation comes to an end. And we're not just facing this play emergency because cars stop our children from walking to nearby playgrounds, or because there isn't space to play, or because our council can't afford play equipment or can't maintain them. These are really significant challenges, but I believe there's a much larger problem. We've overcomplicated playing outside. The challenge is we've consistently conformed to the belief that a good quality playground must be a play space that has a long slide, a wide climbing frame, and at least two swings. What well, if we took the focus off the physical attributes of a play area and instead focused on the play experiences that outdoor spaces around us can bring to life? Over time, I've come to realize that this essential shift in focus won't just come from straining to see a child's perspective or from reading books to understand how children play. These things are useful. But what if we instead gave children the opportunity to have, be the master of their own play experiences? 
What if we gave them the ability to design their own play spaces? What if we changed the way we thought about how playgrounds look, how they should act, and who decides what they should include? What if we deconstructed the playground by giving children a voice? In 2015, I launched Dream Networks. Our mission is Play for All, making play possible for all children, regardless of their socioeconomic backgrounds or abilities. We do this by collaborating with businesses and communities and giving them the ability to empower children to design inclusive play spaces. We've worked with children as young as five years old and given them the power to design diverse and tailored play spaces that have gone on to be used by over 20,000 children in the UK and Eastern Africa. We're making children's dreams of playing a reality by adopting a child-centered approach that focuses on inclusive spaces, play materials, and local connections. This approach was first birthed when I was blessed with the opportunity to travel to Tanzania 10 years ago and volunteer in a rural Maasai community. So when I arrived, I asked them one question. How would they like to use my engineering skills to help them to solve a problem they faced? So back in 2012, I was actually an aerospace engineer. So I was a little shocked when they said, can you help us create a playground? That was until I arrived. And I saw the striking need for play. Amongst the more Maasai community school, there was enough space, for sure. There was a large and dry plot of land that was void of any natural or synthetic materials that would encourage play. To make play possible, I didn't have preconceived beliefs of what the play space should look like. I didn't have a suite of playground equipment in store. But what I did have was connections with the local community. I sat down with teachers, spoke with the Maasai families who regularly traveled through the area, and observed the children playing. And as we did this, we gradually began to understand how the children wanted to experience play and how local materials could be used to cultivate a play space for all children. With a minute budget of just £1,000 and in a period of about three weeks, we were able to create a space full of laughter and joy that was surrounded by a wooden obstacle course, a rope bridge, a netball field and three swings held by two trees. This hard and bound land had become a place of adventure, a place where all children could thrive through playing. In my 10-year career of actually working in play, I've been amazed and inspired to see how individuals, businesses and communities are helping to end this play emergency and make play possible. From temporary road closures in Bristol, to secret gardens in Bournemouth, to pop-up play streets in Nairobi, to transformative play alleyways in Myanmar. Recently, we at Dream Networks launched a playground in a school in Ladywood in Birmingham, one of the most deprived wards in the UK. That's been designed by 60 imaginative 9 to 10-year-olds with the support of volunteers from Tony G and Partners Engineering Consultancy. As I listen to the children scream with excitement as they leaped across a monkey bar and jumped around a reused tree trunk, my attention settled on a seemingly unremarkable pergola just planted in the ground. It provided a place where children can come together and play on the games table, tell stories. As one 10-year-old boy said, we can just hang out and chat. Now, over the last year, two years, I've had the absolute privilege of working in Kittingella alongside two fantastic researchers, Ramazani and Pamela, who are determined to make play possible for all children by creating a safe space to play outside of closed school gates. So Kittingella is a town in Kenya that has rapidly grown as Kenyans have migrated for work and Congolese refugees have been forced to leave their homes, tens of thousands of them, and forced to migrate and settle in Kittingella. As of 2021, there are 42 million displaced refugee children across the world. 42 million. Many of these children live in low-income, densely populated towns and cities like Kitengela, where they lack access to public play spaces. They're not provided, they're not planned for. And to be frank, it's not OK. These children are repeatedly being robbed of their human right to play. Now, just last week, 
I watched the video and I smiled with awe as I saw children squealing with pleasure in this community play space that has now been opened. Using local materials such as wooden logs, tires, sand, <laughs> we've been able to co collectively create a place that is multisensory and playful. We hope that all children, regardless of their ethnicity, age, gender, and ability, will come together and play and experience the joy of playing. It's been designed with 40 Kenyan and Congolese children aged between 7 to 12 years old, and these children have been empowered to create this exciting play space with the support of teachers and parents. We were actually shocked when a local business owner said he wanted to donate a large plot of land that had previously been marked for property development towards this project. He said he wanted to beautify the space through play. He recognizes that not only do children need a safe space to play, but a play space environment is more pleasurable for all. So this is how we can put an end to the play emergency that we are facing. By deconstructing the playground, what a play space is, what it should look like, and who decides what a play space should include. We can make play possible for all children by focusing on children's experiences, including their perspectives, and working collectively to construct an inclusive play space to play. So I'd like to ask you, what will your response be? How you helped upon end to this play emergency? How you show up to make play possible for all children? Have you seen a local space that can be brought to life through play? Can you connect with a business and encourage them to invest in revamping a poorly used play space? Have you got access to play materials that could be used to stimulate playing outside? You'd be surprised by how much play you can get from simple crates, a wind chime, or a ball. Trust me. It's not rocket science. We can make play possible for all children. Thank you.